six one-hour practice sessions for the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000 2018 edition. Wet conditions out there for everybody to deal with right now and likely to stay that way through the day. Seconds. We've got three practice sessions scheduled today. The first of these that's coming up right now is for all drivers, meaning primary and co-drivers. Our second session just after lunch today will be for the co-drivers exclusively and later on this afternoon again for all drivers. But according to the forecast, it's likely to stay wet all day. So as everybody was just speculating in the studio a few moments ago, how they play this session, the way in which you run it, way in which you get organised to sort the car out for it is going to be compromised by this weather. It's likely to lighten off a little bit tomorrow afternoon, but the expectation is for fine weather on Saturday and Sunday. So at the moment, pretty much everybody in New South Wales, those of you that like water, most of us do, showering or drinking, it's a pretty good idea, and the farmers around here are loving it, but for a supercar driver, water on this racetrack equals lots of trauma. Have to be super careful out there. It's going to be extremely slippery. 6,213 metres of wet racetrack at Mount Panorama. We're about 200 kilometres to the west of Sydney, over the other side of the Blue Mountains. It is a beautiful racetrack with a wonderful heritage and one that all of the drivers revere and look forward to every year. There's been an enormous build-up to this race. We've already run the first round of the Pertec Enduro Cup at Sandown. And that was an emphatic victory for Triple Eight Race Engineering with their two Red Bull cars, first and second, and the Autobahn car in position number three. So the second round of the series within this weekend, and this is the 13th round of the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship. So we're building up to a very impressive back end of the championship year that wraps up at the Coates High Newcastle 500 in November, and where we'll crown our champion. And it was a nail biter all the way to the chequered flag at the end of 2017 and every suggestion that that pattern is going to continue because there's just 55 points between first and second in the championship at the moment car number 97 driven by shane van gisbergen and bathurst supercar rookie earl bamber they've got the championship lead from scott mclaughlin and alex Prenner, the frenchman so in the corresponding session here last year practice one dry conditions it was Chaz mostert that got into a two minute six the Super Cheap Auto Falcon car number 55 and it's on screen there at the moment. Now we haven't seen a full field of cars roll out at this stage so some are deciding to just park up in the garage and there's one of them, car number nine, the reigning champions Luke Gilden and David Reynolds preferring to stay in the garage together with Anton Di Pasquale and Will Brown who was just out there a few moments ago for the Dunlop Super 2 first practice session. A slight variation on the Penrite livery this weekend as well. The cars look absolutely spectacular. Thanks to Virgin Australia, a detailed look at this beautiful venue now. We've grabbed our boarding pass, we've headed to Bathurst in New South Wales, a beautiful regional city, and one that trebles in size this weekend as far as population goes. Have a look at this racetrack, 23 corners, 6.2 kilometres, that app by how tight it is up there with concrete left and right, and the rise and fall and the number of blind corners is really quite astonishing. McPhillamy Park is a beautiful place. We enthuse about it, but not when you look at the radar and you see that rain out there at the moment. So at present, we've only got a handful of cars out there. About two thirds of the field have chosen to go out onto the racetrack. The weather at the moment, 13.7 degrees. We're shooting for a top of just 14 degrees. When we all arrived at the racetrack earlier in the week, it was 27 beautiful degrees here. But the weather started to set in yesterday, relatively low cloud. Wind from the east at the moment and expected to stay pretty wet through the day. Light rain falling as we jump on board car number 97, Shane Van Gisbergen. Our championship leader, plus 55 points, six wins, five poles. He's had 15 podiums so far this year. He revels in these conditions and was runner-up at the Sandown 500. He's got a real battle on his hands with car number 17, Scotty McLaughlin, who will be sharing with Alex Premer again this weekend, that partnership endures. They've been having a significant arm wrestle in the recent past. Now, a two minute one was achieved by Shane Van Gisbergen in the GT car here a couple of years ago. So he knows how to guide a car around here very quickly. We jump on board now with Scotty. McLaughlin did an unbelievable lap here in the top 10 shootout in 2017. Makes your hair stand up no matter how many times you look at it. Here he is on the run to the right hander at the chase. Second in the championship. 11 poles, seven victories so far for 16 podiums. Position number four at Sandown for the Shell V Power Racing car number 17. Partners with his friend Alex Premer again. They worked together at Gary Rogers Motorsport in the Volvo program. In fact, it was Scott McLaughlin that replaced 
Alex Prember at Gary Rogers Motorsport at Sydney Olympic Park a few years ago. Alex was having a bit of a battle in the car, and at that stage, McLaughlin was an up-and-coming young charger in the development series. Here we are, car number one, reigning champion in the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship, and he had a fair skate arriving at the last corner there a moment ago, Jamie Wincup, seven-time champion, four-time Bathurst winner, three times a runner-up here, five wins, four poles, 12 podiums year to date, and what a victory at the Sandown 500. He and his co-driver, Paul Dumbrell, who are the second most experienced combination at this location, blew everybody's doors off at Springvale in Melbourne. It was an amazing performance. They even had their own teammates wondering how they managed to achieve the speed that they did. Slithers out of Griffin's Bend at turn two, the Blundstone right-hander, which is uphill positive camber. And if you come out of those tiny little grooves that are in the racetrack there at the moment, be a thrill a minute. A guy who's had a thrill a minute around here over many victories and lots of laps and a lot of experience. Six wins at this location. It's my pleasure to welcome back into the commentary box again this weekend, Mark Scaife. Good morning, Neil. Thank you very much. And how's the weekend unfolding already? The thing you don't want as a driver is to look out of the hotel window and see rain before the first practice session. And this pairing, the most experienced in the field, Craig Lowndes and Steve Richards, you made the comment yesterday on trackside, 1,112 <laughs> races between them. Can you believe that? That's extraordinary, isn't it? It is amazing. <laughs> and as a combination, they've been to Bathurst 49 times. times. It's the leading combination. I mean, that's a that's a fair inning. It's 49 a of, of them. In fact, Richo's had one more here than Craig. Has he? Richo's yeah. had more starts at this location of the active drivers, 25. The guy that's had more starts than anybody is actually his dad, who was your teammate and mentor for many years. Jim Richards had 35 here. Yeah, it's unbelievable isn't it so as you can see track conditions very slippery and very easy to wreck the whole weekend if you have a little whoops or a moment in these slippery conditions those tram tracks there through the fast chicane on the way down at the chase you get yourself into the left hander and this left and right becomes a real change of direction and by the time you get yourself out of here, you have a look at the amount of oversteer. He's just playing there now. He probably shouldn't really be playing <laughs> because it's very easy to make a little mistake to go on the fence on the right-hand side. It's the innate skill that kicks in, though, isn't it? One thing that Shane Van Gisbergen likes doing is playing the flamboyant game in a race car. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter whether he's drifting in a supercar, in a GT car. He hasn't actually done a lot of peripheral work just in the recent past. I said to him yesterday, what have you been up to since Sandown? He said, nothing. So <laughs> they reviewed last year's race at their headquarters at Triple Eight Race Engineering, but he's in a very relaxed state. Let's go downstairs now and say a very good morning to Rihanna. Morning, Crompo. Our defending Bathurst champions, Luke Yule and Dave Reynolds. Uh, Luke, is it a case of airing on the side of caution this morning in conditions that aren't exactly ideal for morning practice? No, we had plenty of practice last year. I think we did 70-something <laughs> laps, so I think we we're okay for the rain. But yeah, obviously, the, I think the weekend's going to be dry, so it's just risky in the car for no real reward. So uh, the guy's going to park it. We'll see how it goes. If it dries out towards the end, we'll probably go out. But yeah, just better safe than sorry at the moment. Dave Reynolds, the cars look absolutely outstanding to, uh, as we see, an incident on track. Absolutely outstanding this weekend. What was it like driving into Bathurst, seeing the mountain? Uh, as the defending champions, was it a different feeling this year? Uh, yeah, just when you sort of crest that hill and just sand down into the precinct, it just gives you a really good feeling from last year and good vibes and you just want to win it again. I don't know about that because you threatened to jump uh, on the podium nude if you go back to back, so um, I'm not sure if that's good for us or good for anyone else. <laughs> yeah, it's no good for no one actually. <laughs> I like my job, so I'll probably keep my clothes on, but you never know. Just never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. never know what the mountain's going to throw up. Uh, relax, and uh, we'll hope to see you out at the end of this session. Thank you. Craig Lowndes, you turned a couple of laps there, mate. In some wet conditions, you got out and you said to Irish it was doing this. Just talk us through what that all means. Yeah, with obviously the rain, we obviously changed our strategy. We're just going to bed some brakes. But even with that, we sort of got a real heavy steering. So, um, yeah, it's not like you get get through what we need to do right now, but it's not a good race car. It just it binds up at times, gets almost locked solid, and then, of course, it releases. So, yeah, not good in these conditions. Yeah, and it doesn't bode well once the weather clears up later on in the weekend. It's going to be pretty heavy. I'm sure the boys will uh, fix it for you. Quickly, mate, looks like you've donned a new lid for this weekend, thanking everybody for their support throughout your career. Yeah, look, I think it's been one of the things that uh, we talked about it for a while, and uh, it was just nice to um, say thank you to all the fans that have supported us over the course of the years. But, uh, yeah, not a good start, but hopefully it's a good omen that we can get it out, all the bugs out of the way and we can get on with our business. I'm sure you will. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. 
Frank Lowndes has had a remarkable full-time career. It comes to a grinding halt on the last lap at Newcastle 2018. But we're going to see him back again next year as an endurance driver with Triple Eight Race Engineering. Six victories at this location in 2006, 7 and 8. 1996, 2010 with my colleague Mark Scaife. And a bit of a moment there for Van Eusbergen on the exit of the Dipper. He's dancing around the edges here a bit at the moment, isn't he? 13 podium for Craig Lowndes more than any other driver out there this weekend. Van Gisbergen just exiting the bottom of the chase. Uh, thanks to Rihanna Crean, to Andrew Jones. We're also going to hear from Greg Murphy and Mark Larkham through the weekend. A busy pit lane reporting team. There's going to be lots of things to cover, like this kind of stuff. Down at the bottom corner, turn 23. And a moment for the Repco service car here. That's actually the second time that that's been in strike down there. Macaulay Jones is driving that car. He's fresh out of the Dunlop Super 2 car as well. So there's the other version. The quick pitch spin is sorted out and joined <laughs> with synchronised spinning by Garth Pander. <laughs> you don't often see that, do you? That must be very slippery in the braking area. On board now with Garth. You see Macaulay disappearing down the escape road. And Garth did the same. In the old days, a lot of the guys used to do that sort of on purpose and then come on to the straight going faster to start their qualifying lap. They've now found a way for that to be banned, but that was a trick in yesteryear. Van Gisbergen is fastest with a 31.19. He has eclipsed the field by roughly one and a quarter seconds over Mark Winterbottom. Chaz Mostert was previously fast. In fact, Mostert was two seconds faster, faster than the next car. Simona Di Silvestro is currently fourth and Will Davison is fifth. Not really indicative yet because, as you can see, still very slippery in some areas. And those two grooves, they're like your lifeline. <laughs> they are very important. You've got to stick the tyres and those grooves like a tram track. As soon as you get outside them, it becomes like ice. Public enemy number one is a painted kerb. Yeah, so and a painted line. Freshly presented this weekend and when we arrive at the racetrack. Bathurst Regional Council and the group at Supercar's done a magnificent job in preparing the place, but as soon as the rain falls, all of those niceties become a bit problematic. So the lines that you spoke of, Mark, the painted curbs, are all a bit of a drama. This is Tim Blanchard, car number 21, cool drive entry operated by Brad Jones Racing. Driving with Dale Wood this weekend. And car number 21 at the moment, as he's sitting in third position, Tim Blanchard. He's done a 36, and the best time we've seen out there is Van Gisbergen's done a 31. Understanding that the same session last year in dry conditions, the best time achieved was Chas Most of a two minute and six second lap. So one of the things that's really important is to try to not get into making the car a wet car. You've got to try to drive the car as you would have run the car if it was dry. That means quite stiff, sway bars quite stiff, springs and shocks all suited to a relatively high grip surface here at Bathurst using the hard tyre this weekend but the, the grip level here is the second highest grip level of the year so normally as the weekend goes on the rubber goes down the cars continue to stiffen up and the way to make sure that the cars are nice is to in the wet soften them so you don't actually want to do that because the weather forecast for the weekend is actually quite good. You don't want to try to chase the amount of setup changes as the week goes on. Murph? Yeah, it's got, it's got you're just uh, number 12's coming to the garage. They're doing a brake disc rotor change. They're actually bedding some of these in at the moment, which is a little bit interesting for me doing that in the wet. But anyway, we can see that uh, it's compulsory for the first time this year, and the guys here at DJ Team Penske have got that situation. That's a similar scenario as what we saw the Nissan's doing in practice at Sandown. It's a complete unit. They uncouple a dry brake, uh, brake line system, and then they put on a brand new disc and caliper with pads already attached. It's uh, pre-pressured, so they put it on, connect it all up through the dry brake, and, and off they go. It's an amazing system they've got going on here, so we're going to see a lot of that over the next few days. But, uh, yeah, new discs going on in wet conditions. Sort of interesting from my perspective. Yeah, they don't get a lot of heat, or not the normal levels of heat cycling that you'd see in the dry, but I guess there's only limited opportunities that they want to use their advantage, get it out of the way so that when the dry running comes, they can get on with performance. Because one of the things that's now going to happen as a result of today's weather, three one-hour sessions are going to pardon the pun, evaporate. Mm. And that means that your dry running, where you get true read on the car, balanced tyre wear, fuel burn, and all of those things. We spotted Todd Kelly there in the garage a moment ago. 
uh, you'll have to do double time work in the dry zones. So they'll probably want to get all that bedding out of the way. But that's going to be a focus area this weekend that Greg's raised with us. So thanks for showing us that. Another moment here for one of the Red Bull cars. This time it's car number one up at the top of the hill at Forest Elbow. Jamie Wincup's at the helm there at the moment. Just got a little crossed up under brakes into the left-hander. That's the slowest corner on the racetrack. There's a couple of them that are pretty much the same sort of speed, though. They hover around the 80, 85 kilometres an hour. We go back to car number 14. This one's driven by Tim Slade and Ash Walsh. Freightliner racing entry. This car's currently sitting 10th on the timing. Making reference again to car number 12 that was in the garage there a few moments ago. It was a big result for them last year. I mean, obviously, we were all very excited for the victory achieved by David Reynolds and Gulden, beautiful drive to uh, execute 161 laps as they did. But uh, a nice performance also with the first visit to the podium for Fabian Coulthard after many tries at this location coming home in third. One of the things that Murph was referring to there with the brake rotor is it's not just about the amount of temperature that you can achieve in these conditions because obviously the brake forces are far less and the amount of front brake rotor temperature is far less. The metallurgy of having water sprayed on hot discs never goes well. So it's, you talk about the natural enemy of the wet weather with a white line or a painted kerb, the natural enemy of the hot rotor is the water. While we're on the thread of brakes and brakes working today, uh, up and down the pit lane, all the teams have got a couple of ovens set up. You can see some pads in here preheating at the moment. So optimal brake temp for pad and disc is about 800, 850 degrees. Now, conventional oven, we can't get that hot. But these guys have this set at the moment at about 100, 120. And what they're going to do is, during this session, come in, put some hot pads in, go back out, and just try and pre-bed them and simulate that change for the race. They've also sent the 888 Lounge car back out. They did a system bleed on the power steering system. That was a whole new rack in that car. Hopefully that sorted it out for Craig. Thanks, Andrew. I had a look at that oven yesterday. That's down there at 888 Race Engineering. Not only can you do your brake pads and rotors, but you can knock together your noodles if you're hungry as well. So you just chuck them in there and heat them up. Good work. Here we go, there it is, I think of everything. So um, all of those little things add up to making sure that you can manage brakes, which have been a very important part of the history of this race over many years. You go back in the early days through the 60s, 70s and 80s, actually stopping the cars around here was a huge part of the story. Thankfully, the technology's got a lot better over the years, but it's still gonna be an area where there's big focus this year. Macaulay Jones fresh out of the Super 2 practice and then straight into uh, your, the car that you're sharing with Nick Perkett. You're probably the best person to give us a read on the track. What's it like out there? Yeah, it's definitely uh, some tough conditions, especially with uh, with it slowly drying out, the track becomes quite greasy. So coming into, into Perkett's car and the car right over here was a lot different to what mine was. We had some pretty good tyres on in my dev car and, and then went over here and they're not so good and the track's very greasy. So it's tough conditions out there, but it is drying pretty quick. They're starting to slowly get a dry line and I think it won't take too long. All right, thanks for your time. Cool, thank you. And uh, further to the break issue, we are going to see uh, more of this this weekend. Here's just another way of doing it. We'll show you this over the course of the weekend. You can see the little, well, you probably can't see, I won't jump in at the moment, but little fingers that the disc engages. And this is because we're going to have this compulsory pit stop for a disc change during the race. And we'll talk much more about that over the course of the weekend. I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for finger trouble there. But if we just come outside here, and these sort of conditions, you know, it's hard. Here we are at Bathurst, biggest race of the year. You've got co-drivers, you want to get them in the car, you want to cycle around. And these conditions, it's kind of not wet, it's not dry, it's not anything. And that's why I've never seen so much emphasis on just brake bedding. Everyone's doing it. As Scafie said, you can't really go chasing a wet car here, but you're really not learning anything. So the question for a team manager is, how much risk do you take in these conditions? How much pace do you chase? How fast do you want to go? I think there's great merit in giving familiarity to your drivers. I don't know beyond that if you can do much more setup wise. No, you certainly won't learn much in setup. I guess one of the beauties of it though is you get a systems check. So you make sure that there are no leakages, that everything's working as it should, and you prepare yourself for when things do dry out. But the risks versus the reward, trying to find a little bit of extra time around here at the moment, that graph in the risk stakes goes a bit exponential as we have a look inside the cockpit of Scott McLaughlin's car. And uh, 
you would be a little bit nervous to stroll livery this weekend and we've already seen some beautiful images earlier in the week and a glimpse of car number 11 in lieu of 15 for Rick Kelly and Gary Jacobson. And that's a Castrol entry that reflects the livery of the 1993 victory for Larry Perkins and Greg Hansford. A little off for McLaughlin down the bottom of the chase. Last time he toured this spot here, it ended in catastrophe. Catastrophe. <laughs> in the Volvo. 16. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't good, was it? So we go back on board now. They're in the garage. So the order at the moment is Van Gisbergen. Look on the top left-hand corner of your screen from Scott Pye, uh, who did a nice job at Sandown. It was a bit unheralded. He just chipped away. In fact, both their cars were quite quick. I don't think we saw the best of them based on a variety of different circumstances that unfolded during the day. So going back to the story, so uh, Van Gisbergen, Pye, and then Stanaway's currently in third position. Scotty's on the phone and uh, having a listen to us. Uh, good morning, Mr. McLaughlin. Mr. Crompton, how are you, sir? Hello, guys. Yeah, it's uh, pretty wild out here. I'd probably be prefer to be where you guys are right now. <laughs> yeah, that was the first thing we said when we came to work this morning, Scotty. There are sometimes it's good to be a commentator. Give us a bit of an update on what it's like out there. Well, I'm just it's a bit of risk versus reward, to be honest. It's, you're trying to obviously find a bit about the car and learn some stuff for yourself for future years at Bathurst, but you don't want to put it in the fence either. It's very, very early, so we're just sort of bringing up a few things, going through our plan and whatever, but yeah, she's slippery out here, so. Scotty, Mark Scaife, is the car uh, basically a dry car the way you've, you've rolled it out? Yeah, honestly, we've just put wits on it, so I wanted to stick to what we knew, and it's probably not a bad thing because we can sort of, if there's ever a wild card later on in the year that we just have to put wits on it. We know that the car is there or thereabouts or what we need to do. So that's what we're, we're working through at the moment. All the best, mate. I'll let you concentrate. Thanks. Stay, stay yes. with it. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Yeah. Ride him, cowboy. It's slippery out there. And uh, <laughs> even the time that you spend that may be relatively short in the garage for the temps and pressures to just cool out in those tyres and go back out on the racetrack, it's just enough to disconnect the grip that little bit more again. Go back out on the racetrack. And your mind will be settled into what it felt like the last time you're out there, and you'll be very careful that you don't just make a what sometimes look like a really simple rookie error. Five k's too quick into a corner, and then you can bowl the wide. Rick Kelly in conversation with George Commons, his engineer. They're driving car number 11 this weekend as we go back and find car number six, Monster Energy Ford Falcon. Cam Waters is currently in 21st. Little excursion off to the grass at the bottom of the chase. That was actually a, a fair moment because it started about 250 metres prior. He hit the curve at the chase, which is the natural enemy of the right-hander. <laughs> More replay uh, action here. Stop. <laughs> this time it's Tim Slade, who makes the right-hander down here. So a couple of people have toured the paddock down there already this weekend. Car the 230s on screen, Milwaukee Racing entry. This is going to be shared by the brothers Davison this weekend, Will Davison and Alex Davison. Their cousin, James Davison, is having a drive in the Toyota 86 Racing Series. So three racing Davisons here this weekend at a venue where their grandfather won the Australian Grand Prix in 1958 in a Ferrari. Yeah, it's very cool, isn't it? What a great lineage. The Davison family. Will and Alex's father was also a very, very good driver. And, and the whole way that they've applied themselves through their racing career, it's actually great to see, James, you introduced me last night he's a nice young bloke isn't he? he's doing a really good job in america and it'll be interesting to see how he goes in the 86s over the weekend andrew yeah i'm back in here at autobahn lounge racing they have decided to take that rack out of the car they've got a new one on the bench that they're going to replace it with so it's more than just air in that system it looks like it's a whole hardware change for these guys yeah so there's Chaz's dad doing a bit of mop work there you go look at that everyone contributes this is what it's a team effort <laughs> Eddie on the tools. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the things that you spoke of before about what you learn, for instance, that issue with Lowndes, that's actually a find. Because that would have actually hurt them more and almost undrivable if it was dry. So a wet session has determined there's a power steer issue. The steering wakes too high. It binds up, which means that the really high load areas, you can hardly turn the wheel. So for those guys, this is a bit of a win. Yeah, so that's all gain, no loss. Yeah. Because you're not going to lose anything. You, 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 you really, you're not losing any session time like you would in the dry. It's wet out there at the moment. So uh, really, there's limited learning. So, but their gain is, hey, we found a problem with the car. Totally. This car reflects 50 years since the very first Holden victory at Mount Panorama. Car number 18 being driven by Lee Holdsworth and Jason Bright this weekend. 
Bruce McPhee, Barry Malholland won in a Monaro back in 1968. The car looks fantastic. Preston Hire Racing, the team owned by Charlie Schwerkolt. He's had a third here back in 2009 with his old mate Michael Caruso, Lee Holdsworth, and Jason Bright's also had tremendous success at Mount Panorama. His first victory came in 1998 with Stephen Richards. They had a traumatic weekend at Sandown, unfortunately, involved in an incident early in the weekend. But 10 out of 10 for the way in which this car's been presented. And we had a bit of fun with you, Mark, at, at Sandown, because that Monaro back in the day, back in the 60s, had Y on motors on the <laughs> rear flanks on the mudguards of that car. And you and your family came from an area on the central coast that had uh, Y on motors. Honk fair square in the middle of it. Your dad, Russell, worked on that car way back in the day. Yeah, exactly. And Bruce McPhee was a bit of a ground-breaking engineer in those days. He drove on the Michelin Road tyre that was buffed and was able to win the first race there in the Monaro that you spoke of. And Wild Motors family, the Levenspilds, Max and Faye Levenspilds, were the owners of the local dealership a long time ago when you could actually have a Holden dealership and win a car race. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and drive to a race meeting in the car. car. <laughs> exactly. It used to amaze me listening to the stories that uh, Peter, Peter Brock and, and Colin would tell you about driving XU1s from Melbourne to Bathurst and running them in so that they were just right by the time they got here. Yep. Remarkable change in circumstances now when you look at the multi-million dollar transporters that disgorge all the gear in these beautiful <laughs> race cars that are absolutely designed to perfection to do 1,000 kilometres and not a metre more. Exactly. And, and that was the same for the Ford factory team. Fred Gibson and Alan Moffat, they tell great stories. John French, great stories of driving the cars in the state to make them run in really nicely. Harry Firth, they were the factory team of the day in the late 60s. So, yeah, things have changed a lot. We're on board now with Will Davison. And this is the final corner. It's very easy to outbreak yourself down here. And you can just hear there that when there's no noise, that's a bad sign. That's exactly right. All the wheels well, are locked. Typically, there's no noise and a lot of lights. <laughs> it's a bad combo. Yeah, <laughs> so, cut number 56 is on screen here. Now, position number two for Richie Stanaway, who's also had a little moment under brakes, this time into turn one in the rabble.com uh, club entry, I should say. And uh, if you think back to Sandown 2017 in wet, greasy conditions, Richie was outstanding. So uh, he's applying himself nicely out there at the moment. Second fastest to Van Gisbergen. So the Kiwis one and two. Chas Mostert next in the queue is in third. Van Gisbergen, 1.7 seconds on the field. Now, I know that there's not a lot of learning to be done, but there's a lot of learning in the way those guys drive the car in the wet. And that is still a very positive sign because one of the things that the forecast does say that there might still be some rain around for qualifying tomorrow afternoon. So although the weekend looks pretty good at the moment, this place does change and throws the odd curveball as we've seen over a long period of time. This is this outside curb. Cam shot, watch this. Wow, the wet. That's right before the turning point of the chase. But as I said, if you've got to drive the car out and do a good job in the rain, that very smart lap time from Van Gisberg, it does bode well for him at a 28 1. Interesting to listen to the sound of the wet tyre on the racetrack down there on the Dunlop curb cam at the chase. They howl when you've got 26 cars out there. It's quite a remarkable sound. Scott McLaughlin coming up to complete his lap. He's down in 16th. He's just moved it up into 10th position, up six spots. Never had a podium here. This is the seventh attempt this weekend, but he's been in contention pretty much throughout his career here. They effectively lost an engine here last year after the remarkable performance on the Saturday, but unlike their rivals next door at Red Bull, they weren't able to repair the car and get it back out there, whereas in Win Cup's case, they were able to patch it up and get it classified as a finisher. So for Win Cup, it was position 20, which was last in the field, but 90 points which turned out to be a big contributor to what ultimately became a championship win at the end of the year. Well, especially when there's 21 points at the end of the season, wasn't there? So that classification of, of being a finisher was a critical element in the way that Wink Cup was able to win his seventh championship and, and also a critical element in Scott not being able to win his first. So just behind Chas Mostert here in car number 55, you can see car number five. Dean Cando's driving it at the moment, sharing with... Mark Winterbottom, and this car reflects the Alan Moffat Colin Bond for Cobra livery of 1978. So the Botlow colours this weekend, the typical green and white, 
that we've known and come to love over a long period of time has been changed. Car looks fantastic, been beautifully presented. And they're also celebrating a Tickford version of the Mustang in these colours as well. Dean Cano and Mark Winterbottom have continued their partnership, which has been pretty successful over a long period of time. And Dean's been with the organisation now for 11 years. So it's been a very solid innings for Dean Cando. The impressive run. And you look at the two of them as a combination, and Mark Winterbottom's been here 15 times before. Dean's been here 19 times now. So there's a vast level of experience and it's delivered some pretty solid results. Unfortunately, last year wasn't one of them. They didn't finish. There was a late race incident up at Forest Elbow. But Canto was runner-up with David Reynolds in 2012. And Mark Winterbottom, well, he was the winner in 2013 with Stephen Richards. James Courtney, you've been out, you've done a couple of laps, you're back in the garage. Is it just a case of you're not learning anything in these conditions? Yeah, that's pretty much it, Brianna. It's um, so, so much you know, it's changing every lap, so it's just drying a little bit. Uh, we changed chassis from Sandown, went back, uh, I changed into a different car for Sandown. Obviously, I had a little accident, damaged it, so we had to go back into the old car for this weekend. So mainly just systems checks. Um, so yeah, we did one time lap, came in, did another one. So uh, we were pretty happy with the balance. The car was pretty speedy on the inlap, we two seconds up on the time we did, but it's just too much risk versus reward here on the first session of a uh, very long week. So we'll sit out and uh, might go for a run at the end if it gets a bit dry. But, uh, but yeah, not a lot to learn at the moment. What's the plan for the rest of the day? I mean, it looks like in terms of the forecast, this is going to set in for the day. What are you going to do in terms of learning and, and making sure you're prepared for the, the rest of the week, given that it's going to be dry? Well, I think it's important Jack gets a lot of running in these conditions. <laughs> the, the little fella isn't that excited about jumping out in there. But, uh, but yeah, it's what you sort of... We did enough running here last year in the rain. We did seven hours of it or whatever. But, um, but uh, yeah, just sort of getting comfortable with it. Um, it's so hard to tune in these conditions with it changing so much. So it's mainly just getting a platform which you're comfortable with. Um, and just feeling the circuit, where the grip is and where the grip isn't. Probably watching as well how it dries in which areas differently. So, uh, so yeah, there's not sort of car set up a lot we can learn. Um, but, yeah, track condition sort of stuff. So uh, we'll go out, play around a bit. Uh, it's a long way till qualifying on Friday. And uh, fingers crossed it's a bit drier because it's a lot more fun when it's dry. All right, thanks, JC. Cheers. Thanks, Aaron. It's lucky 13 this weekend for James Courtney. He's 13th outing at Mount Panorama. He's been a runner-up here back in 2007. He missed 2015 with that injury as we go on board. Car number 56 now. Stanaway's gone to the top on a 27-3. We jump on board with him on the run up Mountain Straight. James Courtney's manager, Alan Gow, has come down. He's a very active part of the British Touring Car Championship. He's here this weekend. And I believe Michael Andretti's coming down from Indianapolis as well. So we'll try and catch up with those guys down at Walkinshaw racing this weekend. So Richie Stanaway just wagging the tail slightly on the exit of turn two. He's got a margin of 0.8 of a second mark over the field at the moment. That was close. He missed the turning point on the kink into the cutting and it ran outside the tram tracks and it had that silent run towards the fence and it just he was parked up, he couldn't do anything with it. And he ended up finding a way in terms of making the groove that it turned left. That was very lucky. Andrew? Guys, I've just noticed a really cool fan engagement opportunity thanks to Super Cheap Auto this weekend. If you're a Club Plus member at the event, you can go and swipe your card at the store here and win the opportunity during our session while these guys are out working to come in, put a headset on, listen to the team, listen to their champion, Chaz Mostert, working away, trying to make his car as good as he can uh, during the session. And it's a really cool opportunity that you don't get to get hold of very often. It's really cool, isn't it? Thanks for that. I saw it down there yesterday. In fact, the super cheap trackside store here this weekend is the busiest store in their entire network all around Australia. There's so much going on over there. It's a dead set supermarket. So uh, they'll get a first hand view of what goes on inside the garage where there's a lot of intensity at the moment. This is the moment that made Mark hold his breath through turn two. There's been a couple of them. So you can see the replay over the top at Skyline as well. Even with the wets on at much reduced speed, you can see a little bit of daylight under the tyres over the top of the hill here. And there's some slippery painted kerbs. You can see them much better in super slow-mo than in normal conditions. And so he peels off. He's still got a margin of 0.8 of a second over Shane Van Gisbergen. We've detailed some of the success that Richie's had over the years. He's had a shocking season, sadly, in supercars this year. But his background as an open wheel driver and a sports car driver in Europe has been incredibly impressive. I think Gisberg has been out of the car for a fair while, so that lap time's not really indicative in terms of 
uh, Van Gisbergen running in similar conditions. So Stanaway 27-3, Van Gisbergen 28-1, Mostert 28-7. When Van Gisbergen got out of the car, he had a gap over the field of roughly 1.8 seconds. So I think Grant McPherson just said, you better stick your helmet back on again and go and have a drive and see what the car's like in these conditions. One of the things that's important is just knowing the scaling as the red flag comes out. It's just knowing the scaling of those conditions, isn't it? You get a bit of a feel sometimes, you go, right, out, well, at a 27, what's the car like? Yeah. So I reckon at a 37, at a 30, at a 27, all of that's no good. What's it feel like? No good. <laughs> that's pretty right. It's two seconds quicker. What's it feel like now? No good. It only feels good around here when it's dry. <laughs> Shane, thanks, Save boys. Us. Save I'll us. take it away from you. Uh, mate, obviously pretty fast out there, getting faster track uh, and going through the old greasy stage, is it? Yeah, it was plenty slippery at the start and um, just just cruise but the car car was good so to have a good gap like that taking no risk is nice but um, uh, hopefully it dries up the rest of the weekend brought back bad memories from last year it's bloody slippery out there but um, felt comfortable and um, yeah we're getting quicker and quicker but truck make, it all in. Did you make some changes try to just I mean while you're out there doing what you're doing at the moment yeah. makes make a little bit of point of being there? I did everything I could skip. to convince Shippy not to go out I didn't really want to so we didn't even put a setup on it just put wets on and just using it to bed brakes and as you can see doing some system stuff now and just uh, getting the car up to speed. What about the plan now if, uh, with uh, what have we got still a bit, little bit 20 minutes odd remaining is you gonna force old mate here in the car or I what? I think I'll do one more run on the next set of brakes and then maybe early at the end but he's got a whole whole next session we've got plenty of time to get him up to speed. Ed you, you were out this morning I think we chatted to you early mate uh, you, you're pretty keen though to go and have another feel on what it's like in this car obviously the DVS car gonna be a bit different to the ZB. Yeah I mean uh, had a good little warm up probably in heavier rain he makes us all feel bad that he just rolls around. I know. It's that quick. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's going to be quite interesting just to see the differences. Um, it's, I have driven that DVS car before, and it's an X car from here last year. It's a X car. So it's pretty close to what we've got here. Um, but hopefully it dries up. I'm keen to do a lap in the dry around here, to be honest. You'll get your chance, boys. I, You'll get your chance. I was going to say, though, every time I've come to supercars, it's rained every weekend, if you think about it. <laughs> you haven't been to too many supercar <laughs> races yet, though. No, but I've done... Every weekend, Winton, Sandown, and here, it's rained. So uh, maybe the farmer should bring me around. Just like Whanganui. Thanks, mate. Just like Whanganui. <laughs> A bit of uh, three-way Kiwi chat there between yeah. Murphy, Bamber and Van Gisbergen. Yeah. We'll decode it for you. He's a Bathurst supercar rookie, but he's had a couple of class victories in the Bathurst 12-hour here, Earl Bamber. Last weekend, he was at Laguna Seca at the Porsche Rentsport event. So he's been a busy boy. He was at Sandown, then back to California, then back down here this weekend. He only got in yesterday morning, Rihanna. Richard Stanaway, if we look at the timesheets, you might want it to rain for the rest of the week. <laughs> Things are looking good at the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'd be happy if it, if it rained all week. Um, uh, yeah, obviously we're struggling a bit for pace in the, in the dry, so it's nice when it, when it rains and it, uh, you know, mixes things up a bit. And uh, as we saw last year, for whatever reason, our, our car just really works at the wet tyre around here and it did the same at the Gold Coast as well. So um, actually it's been something we've been looking back into to, to see because uh, we, we overwork the tyre in the dry and, and overheat it and get it out of its window. So that's obviously why uh, the car works good in the wet. So it's something we've been trying to figure out, but we're still not quite 100% sure why that is but um yeah obviously not, not that excited about the, the timing just yet because it's just uh, the first practice so um yeah still got a long way to go what's the plan for you guys for this session and for the rest of the day given the forecast and and just not getting caught up in, in tuning for these wet conditions yeah it's a bit of a weird uh, kind of day because you can't really uh get much done i guess you know we, we just haven't put a wet set up on you know we just soften our in-car roll bars and, and obviously playing around with tire pressures because it's not really worth uh yeah, looking into it too much. So, a bit of a, an awkward day, really. Everyone's just kind of probably rolling around. And um, I guess if the forecast was was wet for the race, then we'd be probably looking into things a bit more. But just kind of about getting out there and, and doing laps and putting the co-drivers in now and getting them comfortable. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Certainly seems to be the theme of the day, doesn't it? You know, what do you do setup-wise? No one's really going down the wet path. And that's smart because even during the course of a race here, if we got some showers, you're not going to get the opportunity to put wet setups in cars. You know, you just got to kind of drive them how they are. You heard Scotty McLaughlin say it earlier, and I thought that was important. Looking at the cars here, you can see Fabian Coulthard's car there. You look at the rear wing. I was having a bit of a scan of the pit lane, and a lot of wings are up there. We've talked a lot about the angle of the rear wing, but just come with me again. Scotty McLaughlin wasn't lying to us before when he said he was running his dry setup. Here's his wing yet again. Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, look at that 
that distance there, he's running it down quite flat. And it's interesting, you watch a lot of the cars spearing off down the end here behind me, down at uh, the last corner, uh, Murray's Corner coming onto the pit straight. And you've got to think about, so when they come down into there, they're doing about 220 kilometres an hour when they first put their foot on the brake. Now, at 220, this car, via its wing, and its front under tray is making about 450 kilograms of downforce, right? So that's what? Three or four sumo wrestlers sitting on the roof. So that's pushing the tyres down into the road. But by the time they actually go to turn into the corner at about 100 kilometres now, it's only making a little over, I think it's about probably 100 uh, kilos of downforce. So the driver in his mind has actually got a hard on the brake and then he's got to release the brake in concert with the you know, the downward spiral of downforce. And that's quite an art that gets really, really difficult in the wet. Yeah, good point, Larko. That is something that uh, you've really got to deal with cleverly around here because at the top of the hill, as you said, roughly 200 kilometres an hour, they've got 350 kilos of downforce overall. And then at high speed, more like 450. But when you've got to the slower spots, very, very low levels of downforce. And, and overall in world motorsport, basically the cars are... Big power, low aero, small tyres means they're hard to drive. And in the rain, they're particularly hard to drive because the cars skate around a lot. And uh, it's not really, as a wet tyre, the other thing that's difficult to get your brain around is it's not really a wet, wet tyre that we've grown to know over the years. It's a control wet, it's quite a hard wet, and you can drive it for a long time in wet, drying conditions. So. It's a relatively hard compound, so that does make it more difficult again. Triple trouble down there at Erebus. Anton Di Pasquale, Luke Gilden, David Reynolds. Drivers with not much to do at the moment. Lee Holdsworth and Jason Bright. The reason is, by the way, the red flag has been shown and uh, the station, uh, the uh, field stationary now back in the pit lane, there was a report of wildlife on the circuit. So obviously that's been a concern here over the years. So uh, they've red flagged the session until they can ensure that the racetrack is safe once again. Pit exit open. And it is safe once again. Race director Tim Schenken, who's been the supercars race director for a long period of time uh, in CAM's race control. Craig Baird is off to his left, the driving standards advisor. And further to his left is Michael Massey, who last weekend uh, played the role of the deputy race director at the Russian Grand Prix the Formula One event over there. So he's been very busy in the recent past as well. And a uh, whole team of people. Good opportunity for us while things are quiet to always acknowledge the extraordinary efforts in administration and marshalling and all of the intervention services from all of the volunteer officials that are all around this place. There's hundreds of them that give up their time. It's not just for the weekend. Invariably, it's over a very long period of time. There's a lot of preparation goes into this event. So on behalf of everybody in the industry, we thank you sincerely because the work that we all get to do, enjoy and love uh, could not happen without the efforts of all of those volunteer officials from CAMS clubs all around Australia. Here, here, And that is a massive part of the history of this event. And those people have played such a big role in some of the best races that we've ever seen around here. And a lot of those people who have been here for so many years, I've seen people that have come up over the course of the weekend that have been here for 30, 40 years and been officials and played an active role. So it's great to have so many of those people back with us this weekend. Here's Tim Slade just up at the cutting. And that was the little zone that Richie Stanaway was in trouble with as he turned it in through the kink and trying to negotiate what is a very steep section of road. If you stood there, you couldn't believe how steep that incline is coming out of the cutting. And then you don't even really pick up what the decline is when you come along here from McFellamy Park across the top of Skyline and look down the hill. And you can't believe that that actually, this zone here is where Tim actually had an incident last year in the drive. It's the braking area all the way down the hill to that corner, to the dipper. And then again, you accelerate the car out of the Cooper's mid zone down to Forest Elbow again. So the extremity of climbing up the hill and then trying to get the car down through the S's and down the hill. Auto Bathurst 1000 2018. On top of those sessions, there's going to be qualifying together with the top 10 shootouts. So quite a little bit of action to come before we eventually reach 10 past 11 on Sunday morning for 161 laps and 1,000 kilometres around this racetrack. Well, who's going to win the 2018 Bravery Award now? Uh, First man to put 
tyre that's got uh, no, no grooves. grooves on it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I'd be in um, any hurry to try and claim that <laughs> title. I think I'd be quite happy to let my <laughs> brethren just go do their thing. And, uh, okay, you go be the pioneer and I'll see how it goes for you. It's probably not that far away, but would you bother? Would you do it? Because it just hooks into tyres. Car number 33 on screen here. Garth Tanders at the helm at the moment. He's sharing that car with Chris Pither. Chris is also driving in the Dunlop Super 2 Series. And uh, drag race down the hill with uh, one of the Magpies who's still getting over last weekend. Yeah, exactly. Don't bring that up. Don't bring that Don't up. Don't bring it up. Didn't, go, didn't go well for the Magpies. I'm sure Eddie McGuire and Nathan Buckley won't like that gag. Five-point loss to the West Coast Eagles. What a week in sport it's been. NRL Grand Final. The Roosters getting up over the storm. And then one of the great Grand Finals in terms of the quality of the game. West Coast Eagles able to prevail over the famous Collingwood Magpies. Garth Cantander's on. He's run up uh, Mount Strait. There is Chris Kittle. Three times a victor around this location for Tander. Had a couple of poles as well. It's a place that he clicks with. He's been very competitive here. Even in years where he hasn't had a great championship year, he's very often come to Bathurst and been a real factor. So the expectations are that we'll probably see some strength from those guys. Chris, who was on screen a moment ago, and Garth. That's a new pairing this year for the endurance races for the Pertec Enduro Cup. Chris is driving the Gary Rogers car in the Dunlop Super 2 Series. That red light, by the way, that's in the centre of the rear boot lid in the cars is the high intensity rain light. It must be on at all times when the wet tyre is on the car. They're switching on the dashboard for that. That's mandatory. So the car controller or team manager will make sure that he radios the driver exiting the pit lane to ensure that it's on. At the moment, the plume behind the cars is pretty settled out there because there's something of a drier groove. But when it's completely wet, very often that's the only thing that you can see. And even then, you can barely see it, despite its very high levels of intensity. Exactly. We've been, I'm sure you're the same, we've been at almost 300 kilometres an hour down Conrod Strait in the hosing rain. You couldn't see a car length in front of you. You can't see that red light. So that's the, the problem, isn't it, around visibility as Gary Rogers looks on. It's not a nice feeling when you're doing a high speed because you're still in the wet. One of the things that's often misunder long. Yeah. But you go very, very close to the sorts of numbers that you might otherwise do. In fact, at this very location in one of your cars in 92, it was raining that hard in the GTR. Kept pulling the belts tighter and tighter and tighter. And realised in the end all I was doing was just crushing myself like a half open pocket knife. So uh, I was just ending up being lower in the seat because you're so nervous. All you could see was like a brown murk. I remember one of Colin Bond's Sierras was on fire at the bottom of the hill at one stage, and all you saw was a flash of orange in the periphery, and that was it. That's all you could see. It was like being in the yeah, fog. Yeah, yeah. And you're doing near 300 kilometres an hour. Exactly. Well, even in that year, I actually ran into the safety car because I couldn't see the safety car. With the rules. Delinquent off. Yeah, exactly. But I had, no, I had no choice, so it's a great example of the visibility issues around this place. And it comes from the two things. It comes from the severity of the rain and how wet the surface is, but it also comes from the fog and all the drama inside the car of what actually happens to the windscreen. As we pick up on car 19, Jonathan Webb with young Jack LeBrock. I was talking to Campbell Little yesterday. We flew into Bathurst with Russell Engel and I, and we are talking about young Jack, and he's very impressed with him. He's had a pretty good year. There's been times where you think, gee, this young guy's going well. He's probably racing better than he's qualifying. And from someone that's been so experienced, as in Campbell, and being able to guide Jack through the year, it's been a very good season for the young man. There's Campbell right there in the foreground. Well, Jack's the best place for rookies. And uh, yeah. we talked a lot about it at the very beginning of the season five of them commencing their championship run this year. And, uh, uh, yeah, the radar's a, a little bit deceptive at the moment. It does not look like it. Um, for a little while, we should get a dry track. So camp a little on the radio. So Jack LeBrock's currently sitting in 18th in the series for 1,322 points. But it's been a pretty good campaign. And I think uh, relative to expectation, probably a little bit above. Totally. So some people are showing Magenta out there at the moment in their lap time sectors. 
which means that we're likely to start to see a little bit of movement in the peak time. Steve Owen's gone quickest now in Richie Stanaway's car. He's vastly experienced and successful at this location, so that's a new combination for 2018. Uh, Wind Cup's out there moving along pretty quick at the moment, so is Winterbottom. And Shane Van Gisbergen's done a fast sector split, so car number 19, Jack LeBrock, together with the very experienced Jonathan Webb. They're only 22nd at Sandown. Jonathan Webb was the winner here in 2016. He also was the winner in 2016 at Bathurst 12 hours, so that was an incredible year for him. So this is a small team that's typically punched above its weight. And if you cast your mind back to 2014 in race and they had a stop where the car wouldn't restart, it was heartbreaking for Shane Van Gisberg and everybody in that organisation. And uh, they, in other circumstances, might have got their arms around a win. But they did go on in 2016 to pick one up. Hey, Neil, just a quick little shout-out, little tease for the start of the weekend to the great tech centre we've got down here to delve in and hopefully, I guess show you, explain to you things that may eventuate, or things always that do eventuate over here. Obviously our big new screen, which is one, two, eight metres wide. <laughs> we've got transaxles, we've got, in fact, I just saw Rick Kelly, this is a genuine <laughs> Nissan V8 engine. And uh, he said to me, oh, we'll get that engine to you. He said, mate, we've already got it down here. I mean, how cool is that? So we can delve into that. But here's the kicker. Look at this. Got a whole proper current V8 supercar. Mine to tear apart, get into, show you all the bits that we need to. Check this out. I've even got down here. I'll just turn it on. I'm looking forward to having a play with this. My own rattle gun. Oh, Jesus, you reckon I can't get into some trouble with that? <laughs> hey, That's mad, isn't it? You'll be able to hey, you, look at that. You'll be able to sneak over to the super cheap shop and buy some tools because oh. you need to be able to pull that apart. Well, I do. I just saw the boys. I said, I've got to get some tools off your show some stuff. Oh. That's staggering. I've never done that. So seriously, you watch those guys, the way they do that so easy. That has got... <laughs> look at that. That's seriously... Uh, oh, goes off oh, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> 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 that last one was more indicative of your normal performance. Thanks, Larka. <laughs> Steve Owen from... Uh, well, uh, just as I've opened my mouth, Shane Van Gisbergen's gone quicker, so it's Van Gisbergen now from Steve Owen and Lee Holtzworth. <laughs> See, uh, you must have weak wrists, Larka, because the torque twist in that gun shouldn't be that effective. But anyway, they're four and a half kilos minimum weight, those guns. I don't know how they managed to pick up those 20 kilos of wheel and tyre and get it all happening on and off in three or four seconds. It is remarkable. It's something that the crews train for daily, but we're looking forward to your work inside the Hino Hub and having a look at that engine and the car in detail and any of the related drawings over the weekend as we try and simplify the high levels of complexity in supercar racing this weekend. Lee Holdsworth did a pretty good lap there before he's back in the pit. He actually went to second behind Van Gisberg and temporarily. This is going to be interesting because as we see the monster falcon down the escape road there at turn one, there's a couple that are we hearing Blanchard might be going out on slicks. A couple have actually been quite clever at the end because they've put their co-driver in now to get a little feel for these conditions, given that it might rain again later on for the next co-driver only session. This is David Russell in car number six, the monster energy falcon that you saw just have that little excursion a moment ago. So. Uh, this is also a new combination for 2018. They were paired up, obviously, at Sandown as well, where they finished 13th, so not a bad result. Qualified 13th, finished 13th in the Monster Energy Ford Falcon. Cam Waters has also had a pretty difficult season. The low point for him, sadly, was at Winton, where they had all sorts of trauma. It hasn't been an easy year for those guys, but this is a racetrack where that team's typically done very well as we go back and find car number 230. The Milwaukee Racing Entry's got Will Davison driving it at the moment and he's currently sitting up there in sixth. He's done a personal best in sector one. Got the wiper on, which suggests to me that I don't like the idea of a bright, shiny tire on the car over the top of the hill if Will's decided that it's time to continue to have the wiper on. Well, the problem is, isn't it, the place being such a big, long lap, it can be dry down at one end or drier down at one end and still very wet at the other, and that can be either way, mountainside or down at the pit area side. So he's on his 15th Super Chief Auto Bathurst 1000 this weekend, Will Davidson, so vastly experienced. He's one of the guys that knows the feel of the place that you described before, Mark. Let's go down to Greg. Yeah, that little bit of information, I think you got uh, the escape here about uh, Tim Blanchard. Um, he just came down into turn one, and I could see, uh, I'm pretty sure that he was on a slick tyre. So, uh, and it is unbelievably slippery down here at one. The amount of cars that are still going off up into the escape road and locking up brakes and going forward 
you know, missing the apex down here is phenomenal because I suppose you can see that there's a bit of runoff. You're not going that fast. The opportunity to push a bit harder is is there for the driver to explore. But uh, in a wet tyre, I can tell you right now, there's still a lot of moisture on this road. So uh, he's taking a big risk being out there on that tyre. Uh, we were talking about the Bravery Award. Well, he's is, won it. Well, is it Bravery? I don't know. You call it Bravery Scavey or do you call it something else? Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, so on the computer timing, it's showing as an S. So that's a Dunlop soft tyre on that car. Every other tyre has got a W next to it at the moment, meaning a wet. And you'll see that the high intensity rain light's been switched off on car number 21. 2016 with Macaulay Jones, Tim Blanchard finished 10th. They did a great job two years ago. Typically, Tim is very strong here. He's a guy that understands how to manage to survive to the end of an endurance race. So he's carried pretty good pace here over the years. 19th at Sandown a couple of weeks ago and uh, taking it very, very gently over the top of the hill on that Dunlop slick tyre at the moment. It's almost walking pace as he approached the dipper up there. So uh, looks as though the grooves are drier down the bottom of the hill than they are at the top. Always amazing when you see these cars come back in after a wet session, just how grotty they are. Oh. You know, they pick up all the road grime and the, what the wet tyre does is it throws all the junk up in the air and when you're in the plume that's uh, been thrown up by the preceding car, it lands on your car, they come back remembering that when they rolled out here yesterday, it was a time rich day yesterday for everybody, a lot of spare time, a lot of chat, people wandering up and down looking at each other's cars. Beautiful cars, look like they're in a motor show. By the time they get to the end of this session, they look like they've been through a sandblaster. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and the water gets into everything. So in the back of the bearings of the uprights, through all the drivetrain, every single element of how they operate in wet conditions is tested. It's a very difficult situation for teams to prepare properly afterwards. Now, one of the tools that we've got for the weekend, we just went and had a little expose of Larco in his tech centre, but Neil and I are going to use the virtual eye, which, as you pick up there, the red line is the perfect run from Scott McLaughlin's qualifying lap last year. And we were able to see history being made in that qualifying top 10 shootout. Conversely, we've also seen some mistakes that have been made in qualifying, and this one was Chas Mostert. Now, check this out. This is great technology. And right there is where he made contact with the left-hand wall and pinballed himself into the right-hand fence. And there's the red line versus the blue line, which is the difference between the way the cars come off the dipper. And bang! And the result is one of the biggest incidents we've ever seen at Mount Panorama. But it does show, we talk risk versus reward all the time, that's a classic case of the smallest mistake in qualifying having catastrophic circumstances. Yeah, that one was broken bone, sadly, for Chaz Mostert in qualifying on Friday several years ago. But uh, great technology, thanks for the explanation on that, Mark, and we'll use that technology through the weekend to unravel some of the things that are going to unfold here as we go back and pick up car number 55 on screen. Super Cheap Auto Racing, Chaz Mostert. He's at the top of the timetable at the moment, 2 minutes 26 and he's on a lap that's likely to improve it. So through sector one, he's done the best job that we've seen. He's actually hunting more wet track at the moment through McPhillamy, searching for a bit of grip on the wet tire on the outside line. The second timing intermediate here, by the way, is on the exit of Forest Elbow. So the first one that we will be making reference to is uh, just climbing up through Sulman Park, coming out of the cutting. This is the end of sector one. Sector two is coming up in just a moment as the cars can crossed up nastily as he tried to get it to change direction in second gear down here at the bottom of the hill. Right about there's where Intermediate 2 is, and that wasn't probably as a result of the big slide, uh, the best sector that we've seen so far. And, uh, and then obviously pretty straightforward run. It's a drag race down here. So still a little bit of a plume from that car, but that's because Chaz is hunting for it. He's not driving in the dry grooves at the moment. He's actually trying to keep the wet tyre a little bit cooler doing a brake rotor change back at Tickford Racing at the moment in the sister car number six. So it's having a fair wriggle. These wets will be very second-hand when he gets to the end of it because when you've got a little bit of dry track out there like this, it fluffs up and rounds the edges of the blocks on the wet tyre, overheats and kills it. But he's going to put together a better lap here. He's on a 26. He'll move that marker for sure. 25.5. So he's opened the gap up to Earl Bamber at 0.8 of a second. Warren Luff and Scott Pyre on the right-hand side of screen. They were also very strong here last year, got on the podium with a great drive. 
So Craig Lowndes' difficulty in this session continues. They replace that whole rack, as I mentioned before. The issue is still there, guys. And spoke to Steve Richards real quickly. He said, this is just basically a process of elimination. We're just going to keep swapping stuff until we fix it. No time left in this session. So now they're just going through their break. Just to found it the gremlin or at least identified it they haven't found the source of it yet but rather than try and find it they'll replace everything until it vanishes so if you contemplate this i know we've, we've got a reasonable forecast for the weekend but if it is wet the standout performance in this session were van gisbergen mostert and stanaway they were probably the three fastest cars alex premier's on screen here at the moment in car number seven and you can see that car moving around on the wet tyre blocks. One of the other hallmarks of, a, of an overheating wet tyre is the, the car wriggles on the tyre, it wanders, it tracks all over the road. And that's what you saw as that car was making its way to turn 23 down at the final corner. Car number 17 currently sitting in 12th position. Alex Premer, the fast Frenchman who lives in Las Vegas, been doing some GT racing this year, been more active in the race seat this year. He runs an exotic driving school at the Las Vegas Speedway and was full-time in the Supercars Championship until not terribly long ago, and that's his teammate, Scott McLaughlin, who's got the fastest lap around this place. Run through those numbers for you, Mark. So practice record belongs to Scott on the right, 2 minutes 4.1. Qualifying record, McLaughlin, 2 minutes 4.2. Top 10 shootout record, McLaughlin. <laughs> Broken record going here, 2 minutes 3.8. But the lap record still belongs to David Reynolds, 2016. Davey's got that at a 2 minute 6.2, but it's all McLaughlin town for the rest of it. Tim Blanchard just come back into the garage. He's actually gone back out on wet tyres. I spoke to his engineer. He said, Tim said, it's probably doable on slick tyres at the moment, but he's not able to get enough out of the tyres and to get a good read on a lap. So he's more comfortable on the wet tyres at the moment. Yeah, I reckon that's a pretty good plan. Yeah, that's a good call. Yep. Thanks for the update, Rihanna. Mostert, Bamba, Pye, one, two, three, and uh, car number two, Scott Pye, Warren Luff. They're currently uh, back in the pit lane at the moment. The car's not active on the track. Wind Cup's moved it up into fourth position now as we pick up car 21 once more. Tim Blanchard's sitting in 21st position. Now they've gone back onto a wet tyre. So Tim's gone out there, played the pioneering game, decided that you're a big chance to get eaten when you're a pioneer, so he's come back and put wets on it. Exactly. Well, we saw the lap that he went out and it was very ginger. The rough rule of thumb is 10 seconds per one minute lap. So around here, if the cars do fives and sixes in practice, you've basically got to be better than a two minute 25 to have a slick tyre on there. So that's right at the cusp now. But again, you take big risks because as soon as you come off that dry line, you get to the wet section on a slick tyre, basically in the fence. Our resident engineer, Oscar Fioranotto, and I had a long discussion about the crossover about a week ago on the phone about when you know, the, thing, get alive. the things you do uh, about when you might choose to switch because it depends on which direction you're going whether it's dry to wet or wet to dry and what the track conditions are at the moment what residual temperatures you got but we've taken a stab at about a 20. Right. so we had to arbitrate there was a little bit of arm wrestling going on yep. i was batting for conservatism the engineer was batting for just go out there and hurt yourself and i went I reckon that it'll be more like a 20. So at the moment, they're averaging about 25s, 26s. So it'll, it might even be a little bit higher than that in these conditions that we've got right at the moment with that easterly blowing. You could have called me. I was at Noosa Surf Club. <laughs> I was talking about tyres. <laughs> Pretty much a snapshot of our lives. <laughs> You've got to do some other stuff. <laughs> What's that sound I can hear in the background? Wake up, everyone. <laughs> Now, off the road, making a little mistake down at the final corner is Earl Bamber. He's just exploiting limits out there. This will be valuable for Earl, even though he's done some running here in the 12-hour. Supercar seat time is going to be valuable for him at the moment, every kilometre. He's out there in Brenton Grove's Super 2 car as well in the Dunlop Super 2 series. And, in fact, even when this session started, a press release came through from Porsche Australia, and he's going to be uh, running at the Gold Coast in the final round of the Carrera Cup up there. And that's all about getting mileage, apart from being one of... Porsche's lead drivers, um, reigning world endurance champion, twice Le Mans winner at Laguna Seca last weekend as a part of his duties with, with Porsche around the world. Been a very busy and active race driver this year, but he's jamming on the miles because for supercar racing, he's at the opposite end of the scale. There's a fair amount of rookie involved in what he's doing at the moment, but you wouldn't have thought so when you saw the drive at Sandown a couple of weeks back where he got 
onto the podium. And he and his co-driver Shane Van Gisbergen were runners up and it was an impressive performance. Yeah, and he's, he's driving the car very conservatively, which is clever. He obviously highly experienced and highly credentialed, but some of the lines, he's been talking to Van Gisbergen, the line coming out of turn two out of Griffin's Bend, he, he didn't run it right over the top of the edge of the road. The rise of the road has a big camber off section to the left. He ran it right up on the fault line of, of centre of road. And he's been nice and conservative down through here because easily, if you get too much of that kerb, you can easily run the car wide and you end up making contact with the left-hand side fence there. Even the run just there, he left a lot of road on the way out of the dipper. So that's clever. That's just getting your eye in and making sure that you've got this whole thing sorted out. Nice and calm. Big chance we're going to see some new numbers. In fact, one of them that I was keeping an eye on has just done a better time. So Will Davis has gone to the top on a 25 flat. There are some people out there. There's a lot of green on our computer timing at the moment, which means personal bests. Van der Graaf's sixth gear, pressure tap on the brake pedal just to make sure it's all settled. Can't get through there flat in these conditions at the moment, so good decision not to bomb in there too quick. So at the moment, it's Davison, Mostert, Aaron Russell in Andre Heimgartner's car. Every car out there is on a wet tyre. Checker flag is being shown at the start and finish line. In fact, it's the finish line here. They're offset the start and the finish lines. Whoa, we only barely Whoa. got a stop down there at Murray's. And there is the control line, whereas the start line is there. So they're offset by a few metres. So Will Davison, Chas Mostert, Aaron Russell. We look for car number 97. It's currently in fifth position. And there is Chas Mostert, 2014 winner of this great race. Imagine how much faster Chas would be if he got a haircut. <laughs> you give him such a bad time about that stuff. Earlier in the year, he did threaten to come up and grab you. <laughs> he was sending me texts. That's fine. I was enjoying that. <laughs> he was a young race fan himself at one stage. In fact, not that long ago, he trotted up. He and Eddie are real aficionados of the history of the sport. And there's a shot of a very young Chas Mostert parked between a Mr. Crompton and a Mr. Seaton back uh, in the Ford Tickford racing days. So he knows what it's like to be a young race fan. And it's great to see somebody that's got all that passion and fire progress to being a real champion in our sport, ultimately a victor at Bathurst, and that's what Chas Moss has been able to do with his passion. Yeah, and that's the one thing that we spoke about a lot through the course of this year, that their cars this year haven't been good enough, but Chas, from a personal exertion standpoint, he's picked the cars up and carried them, and he's one of the best drivers in the field. We often talk about McLaughlin, and we talk about Van Gisberg, and we rave about Wink cup, but don't you worry, Chas Mostert is very, very good. And there's Alex Premer with a bit of contact there with Scotty McLaughlin. He did a really good job there at the end, Alex. Let's have a look at our practice one results for you. Bit of a weird session. One hour with one red flag after some concerns for wildlife. Will Davison's ended up doing the fastest lap right at the very end of it. He's got a half second margin over Chas Mostert. Good start for him. Nice work for the boys down at Nissan for Andre Heimgartner and Aaron Russell from Newcastle. Michael Caruso quick as well from Mark Winterbottom. Fabian Coulthard in the car at the end. Earl Bamber, Simona Di Silvestro, three Nissans in the top 10. Scotty Pye, Jamie Wink up 10th. And then just outside, Richie Stanaway was fastest for a very large chunk of it. Then Steve Owen got in the car at the back end. Then we had Cam Waters, uh, and they did a brake change in that car. Jason Bright, Todd Hazelwood, Jack LeBrock, Alex Premer, you saw him getting out of the car before. Tim Blanchard, who ventured very temporarily onto slick tyres and then got back off them again from Musket, Slade, Lowndes with steering dramas with that car, Pippa Percat, uh, Kelly, and then James Courtney. Chaz Mostert dropped a P2 at the end there, but he sat at the top of the timesheets for a long time. Conditions tricky? Yeah, pretty really tough. Um, I probably expected the session to rain more towards the end there, but a uh, bit of a dry line out there, so I reckon probably the last lap or two could have been slick, so I reckon. But, um, yeah, look, just run around, do our brake program and all that kind of stuff, get ready for the weekend and, um, yeah, try to keep it off the wall. Co-driver session coming up next for Moff. You give him some information off the back of what you just learnt then? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, it's very weather-dependent what we do in our sessions today. And uh, Moff, you know, he's obviously got double duties this weekend with the Porsche and this. So he'll, uh, he'll have plenty of laps in his Porsche and also plenty of laps in this. And, um, you know, he'd probably be even more with the track conditions than what I am after this session and probably P3. So, uh, yeah, Moff uh, did a good job at Sandown. Looking forward to this weekend. And, yeah, it's just good to, um, yeah, start the practice one.
Just one last one before I go, mate. I was down in the tech centre before where you guys have donated a super cheap auto car for us to use. Eddie was in there and he was asking questions whether they, whether or not he could enter that car for himself and Alan Moffat. Do you know anything about this? Um, look, probably wouldn't surprise me. Dad's been coming here since 1970. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you never know. Maybe a late wildcard entry. I'm sure supercars would allow it. Thanks for confirming that for us, mate. Well, Alex Prima did do a few laps there towards the end uh, in the 17. But, Scotty, it's one of those sessions, isn't it? You sort of... It doesn't feel like you've actually got going yet this morning. Um, sort of, did you achieve much from that one other than doing a few brake bedding cycles? Yeah, uh, that's about it. We um, basically left it as a dry car almost and just saw what was, uh, tried to learn as much as we could. But, yeah, look, we, we feel comfortable, very predictable, and which is nice, but um, just probably not pushing the limit just, so, just yet. <laughs> What about you, Alex? I mean, it's good to go and get a bit of a feel with it. I mean, you guys have got another session coming up very shortly. Although, looking at what it's doing out there at the moment, very unpredictable to know how you're going to head off uh, and do another hour session by yourself. Yeah, of course, yeah, but it's always nice yeah, to walk as a team, yeah, just to have a, a good feel with the car going through the mountain, yeah, because, I mean, it's been quite more yeah, that we didn't drive on the track, yeah, so it's nice yeah, to get back on the... On the limit, on the wall, on the white line also, but for sure on the on the wet condition, it's kind of a little bit harder. It's failed that, uh, yeah, we start as we finished last year, yeah, so it's kind of weird, yeah, for the first time. For me, it's like seven years, yeah. Uh, first time on the wet condition, first time in, around battles, but it's it's cool, it's nice, yeah, to hey, be back on the road track. He's forgotten about last year. Go on, you go and argue amongst yourselves, you two. Yeah. Oh, but <laughs> Down here with Will Davo, uh, P1 there, mate. Uh, we were talking about a bravery award for that session. I reckon you got it. Trying conditions, risk versus reward. Did you go risk? No, I actually didn't. I actually used that comment on the radio a couple of times because it's really hard to learn much. Uh, when it's greasy like that, you make a few changes to the car. Uh, you, you sort of can't really learn too much. Besides tyre pressure, we know how critical that is, whether it's full wet, intermediate, all these drying conditions. Uh, there's no right or wrong. It's just trying to know what's right for the conditions. So we read the conditions, you know, we made changes, and, um, yeah, I, I sort of... We were pretty quick the whole session, but that was, yeah, it was uh, not too much risk. <laughs> well, just very quickly, mate, you, um, you got a really good read on it then, on a wet tyre. If you could pick a number, wet tyre to dry tyre, from what you've just seen then, what is it? Well, actually, I just said then, when I did that lap, I said, I reckon we're within a few laps. If, if it was the race now, I'd probably, I'd probably come in right now, because there was certainly enough dry track to generate some temp. There were some corners that would have been seriously dicey, but I think you'd have a crack right about now. Thanks, mate. Great heads up. <laughs> nice job, Will Davison. 0.5 of a second, former winner around here. 2 minutes 25.02 over Chaz Mostert.